Yes, I'll be talking about um, um, the application of some uh, deep reinforcement learning algorithms to the problem of mixed autonomy traffic via moving vehicles. The original motivation of this is uh, goes back to some early work done by the SMART Consortium in uh, for the U.S. Department of Energy and motivated by even prior work by McKinsey and the others um, uh, from uh, UW, in which one of the things they showed is that um, depending on the way self-driving vehicle or automation is used, um, a mixed autonomy world and a full autonomy world could lead to either an increase or decrease in um, energy footprint of congestion and traffic. And part of this work specifically addresses the question of how do you reduce that footprint? So um, uh, I think most of this crowd knows the different types of modeling that have been commonly used in mobility studies, uh, you know, starting with the multi-agent systems, which Beam or Bistro or Polaris and many of them instantiate. So kind of focusing at the agent level uh, that, that traditionally has been used for multi-million agent simulations to micro simulation at this level here, which usually traditionally for half a century has been a way to abstract traffic flows and networks in the form of pipes and, and fluids um, to microsim, which um, until recently were mostly used for a smaller number of vehicles where all the vehicles um, are modeled to a certain degree of accuracy. Um, and then finally the individual level where now you could really have autonomy or like things below the hood. And I think part of the revolution that we see is that this level here uh, over the last five years has become tractable, calibratable, and there's enough data to start to make it work at scale. So the notion that, you know, you could use it for a few intersections and traffic lights and that's it, it's kind of over now. It's like, we're not that far from being able to run cities at that um, level of granularity and that's the anchoring of our work. Um, so for those who have not seen micro simulation before, um, there are state-of-the-art tools that are available on the shelf. Imson, which is now owned by Siemens, or Visim by PTV, um, uh, which are like the two standard tools used in, uh, in industry. And then Sumo, which is essentially their counterpart um, at the, you know, in the open source world, which is what we're using. We're using both Imson and Sumo. Uh, so the, the movie here shows you an, an, an idea, gives you an idea of the granularity at which you can model traffic with these tools. Um, so uh, the motivation also is that we don't want to reinvent the wheel. The idea is um, focus on the optimization and the learning and the control uh, and let the modeling to the experts. And so in this field, um, I, I think there's a lot of challenges. There's the data, there's the calibration, there's the model computation, and then there's the control and the RL. Uh, this talk does not speak too much about the data. Um, we worked on data in a previous um, set of projects. Lots of people around work on data. Um, but about calibration, on the other hand, is actually quite complex. Uh, the computability of the model is also an issue, and certainly learning over the model is the next frontier. And so that's kind of like where our efforts are focusing. And more specifically, and I'll talk about it at the beginning, we're creating a coalition of academic partners and now industry partners to try to demonstrate this over the next two years, where this is now year one, and we're doing the, our first test this year's. And we'll try to do bigger tests next year to demonstrate the what you'll see in the talk, but but in, in, in real deployment, and also some spectacular videos of the test site that is being currently built in Tennessee by Vanderbilt and uh, my colleague Dan Works team. So let's just jump back in history. I think all the aficionados of uh, um, traffic engineering will recognize the picture of Bruce Greenshield, who was the first person who is credited for measuring traffic congestion. Um, I do get an indication that my internet out, but I'm making the assumption you're still hearing me now. Um, so fast forward 50 years, um, Sugiyama run this interesting experiment um, in Japan where they asked to essentially um, assemble drivers in the parking lot and tell them to drive at the constant speed that they were given and just maintain their distances. And um, if you've seen that video, it's a classic. If you've not seen that video, uh, if you keep watching um, um, the, the, the people, you'll see that after not so long, essentially it's traffic breakdown and collapse because people just can't regulate. So humans are just inherently not good enough um, to regulate and even simple things like this are, are not things that they do well. Um, fast forward another 10 years, this team led by Dan Work from Vanderbilt 
um, did the following experiment. They did the same ring experiment, but now they inserted a self-driving vehicle in it, um, identified by the black arrow, first driven by a human, which is why you can see, again, humans being very bad at regulating these oscillations. And now, when the car will turn red, and what happened, essentially, that's engaging that first, and that essentially smooths traffic. Uh, this was a real breakthrough because, um, so this was a pivotal event in the, in the, in the history of mixed autonomy traffic um, in, the, in the following sense. Um, I think this is the first time someone demonstrated, um, you know, repeatedly and in a controlled environment, the ability to reduce traffic waves uh, in that way. Um, and uh, that led to a lot of questions. Now, one year later, um, Kathy Wu, who is now a professor at MIT, former from the group, um, realized this experiment, which I'm about to show here. So this is in Sumo. The red vehicle is the self-driving vehicle. The blue vehicle is the only vehicle it can sense, and every white vehicle has, you know, some form of uh, IDM or car following model or you know some model like this. And you can see um, the instability forming until now we've turned the other. And uh, with the nearly identical algorithm, except it's actually very different, um, the traffic is smooth. Now, at this stage of the talk, you're probably wondering why am I showing you a run in simulation of 2018 when an actual experiment was done in 2017? And the reason is there is a major difference is that the, the 2017 test was the first test that used physical models of all the vehicles um, and physical measurements of the vehicle in front of the cab. So in other words, it used the equation-based or model-based um, model of traffic and demonstrated the ability to smooth the traffic. That 2010 experiment um, in, in simulation does not have a model. So in other words, um, it does not rely on the explicit model of the traffic. It only uh, relies on the ability to simulate a policy on a simulator. In other words, what the red algorithm is doing is a simple RL algorithm I'll show in a minute. Um, but in order to learn, um, one does not make the assumption that one has access to the dynamics of these vehicles. One only makes the assumption that the red has a reward function, and I'll explain what that is, um, and can access to, this, to the state of this uh, car. So all the algorithm needs is essentially someone who knowledgeably built a simulator. It's model free in that sense, because the model is not accessible to the learning um, in order to learn the, the policy. And so that's why it's actually quite remarkable that uh, if, you, if you look at history in that way, in one article, um, one person, Kathy, managed to essentially pivot over half a century of work, which in essentially she could afford to ignore. And I don't mean this in a bad way because we actually do need both and model-based approaches enable warm starts and a lot of good things to learn faster. But the point is that in between the first instantiation of these traffic measurements in 2008, there probably were 10,000 of article or more on traffic instability, traffic flow, shockwaves, and whatnot. Since that 2008 um, experiment, there's probably 1,000 articles focused on how to try to control it. Um, and in one article, essentially um, not relying on any of this, the algorithm was able to beat all the rest. And so um, the reason why it's pivotal is not so much because it managed to beat all the rest, but as much as because it essentially enables to learn from high um, uh, fidelity simulations, which really is a different way to look at um, uh, traffic control. So the rest of the talk, will try to use the same color coding to illustrate what we're doing. So every time you see a red vehicle, it's a self-driving vehicle. Uh, what it can do is access the state, so velocity and position of all the vehicles in blue, and then it doesn't know anything about the vehicles in red, in, in white. Um, these are just models of vehicles. So the interesting thing is if you try the algorithm on this setting and try to standardize two rings, um, what it does is it behaves like a perfect jerk, uh, essentially preventing the people in the back from passing, but with the exact same um, uh, algorithm enables to stabilize a double ring. And, and actually, I know there are people in the audience who worked on lane switches. And, 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 and if you've worked on lane switches, you know that it's a big headache because the discrete choice associated with switching lanes actually leads, usually leads to exponential uh, com explosions, uh, commercial explosions of the state space. So it's actually hard to come up with algorithms that have switched lanes. 
Uh, and here, the, the point is the same exact learning algorithm works. Um, and you could argue, yeah, well, that's not so exciting because you learn that in police academy. So um, it's still simple and yeah, fair enough. I mean, you should really view this as a Lego block. Um, so then the question is, could you do things which are a bit more um, uh, ambitious with it? Um, so here's another example of an intersection where um, if you just don't have any control in it, um, the, what it does is it actually will use the um, right away formula that, you know, politeness uh, of intersection management where you let every car go and that's probably the most inefficient way to um, regulate an intersection. If you actually um, uh, use the same algorithm, what's amazing here is that if you observe precisely, the red car picks the exact speed that leads to maximizing the length of the snake of vehicles so that by the time it reaches the intersection, it, exa it exactly enables to pass without creating a crash, which is in that case, probably the best way you can maximize throughput. Um, and the point is when it learned that the red car did not have a model of the uh, IDMs or CFMs or car following models that are um, in the blue, it just figured out from simulation to compute that speed. And obviously I'm rationalizing this here. So it's like almost like a post facto explainable AI, uh, but the point is it's all completely automated. So you could also argue it kind of rediscovered platooning if you plot the trajectories and time phase diagram where the cars perfectly alternate with each other versus uh, just passing in block. Uh, this example is also interesting because now uh, we're trying to maximize the throughput of this intersection. Uh, so again, if you just let the car use the politeness formula, this is um, very inefficient. Um, but if you do apply the same algorithm, then um, um, uh, the red car, you know, holds cars behind and at some point just now decides to release the queue, but it's harder to rationalize. And the point I'm trying to convey here with this movie is that um, now, in a sense, the um, reinforcement learning has exceeded um, the ability of the human to come with ex specific strategies because it's not something I could rationalize uh, easily. So um, it's not explainable as much, if you will. Other interesting uh, things to do are transfer learning approaches where you learn in a setting and you deploy in a different setting the algorithm has never seen. So learning on the ring and then passing and uh, transferring on the road. Um, that's the learning, I'll come back to that later. Um, so. Uh, if you just have an uncontrolled case, that's what it looks like. So once in a while, an injected car will create these waves you see forming close to the merge. Uh, here's another one. Okay, now it's bigger. And then you see them propagating more and more. Uh, so um, now if you uh, inject a self-driving vehicle in there, um, it can sense all the blue cars. So it has information about downstream. Uh, and what's interesting is you'll see them slowing down, creating a void like you see the red car is slowing down to try to, to, to avoid this. And it's even slowing down as much as now it's actually stopped. So it's like you, you've had a self-driving vehicle learn to be a traffic light. So essentially stopping traffic things. But that's the interesting part here is it actually did learn it on the ring. It did not learn it on the intersection. Um, and so again, I mean, if you look at the time space diagrams, what's happening is pretty clear. Uh, every time there's a merge that creates some form of a need for capacity, which back propagates in the form of a shock wave. Um, and then if you have access to the policy, then the policy sees that because it sees the blue car in the front. So it preventively slows down and stops. That's the quote traffic light. It's almost like transforming into a traffic light so that it reconnects in the way that maximizes the throughput here. And here the throughput is, 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 is perfect. Uh, so this work um, was pivotal in us starting to work with the Department of Energy. It was picked by Science Magazine um, because at that point we were already advanced enough to start demonstrating that you know, with up to 10% AVs on the simple road, you could essentially shave traffic entirely. And obviously that's idealistic. Um, reality is more messy, but that became a motivation for us to work on the flow smoothing uh, effort we're currently work on. So the, the current target here is stop and go waves that uh, you see here. I don't know if the um, video is uh, high resolution or uh, there's another frame um, rate is, is good enough, but you should be seeing these pockets of congestion that propagates back and forth um, uh, on, the, on the left and on the right here, as it's zooming, you see it uh, pretty carefully. But the point is that, um, you know, there is enough capacity. It's really just flow inefficiency here. It's like we're not uh, jam-packed, we're just not efficient. And so 
the idea is like now can we use the same algorithms to work on these more expensive um, uh, problems so the model we're using for this i'm going to fast forward here um, uh, which was initially developed in Emson and is now in Sumo, um, is the I210 corridor model that was it took three years to build for the U.S. Uh, for the California Department of Transportation. Um, so it's a fully calibrated model that also contains the arterials. We're not using the arterials here; it's just freeway. But that gives you a sense of the granularity of the model that is used for the learning. Um, and so here, what, what we've now managed to achieve with hierarchical learning and uh, with multi-agent adversarial learning is an, uh, uh, we've managed to shave the, the, the oscillation. So I'm going to show it to you. Um, so this is uh, the zoomed version of the, of the bigger network you see here. And initially, the, you, there's no blue car here. There's just uh, red cars. You can see it's clogging. So we've not turned on the um, autopilot. Uh, we've not turned on any algorithm. And the, that big shock wave is, 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 is forming. You can see it flooding the the, the small window here, and now there's stop and go, stop and go, and stop and go. In a second, you'll see blue cars appears. That means we've turned on the policy. And at that point, it will start to regulate. So you can see it like slowing down and then speeding up and then slowing down again, speeding up. There's probably in a delay in my talking and you seeing on the picture, but I guess you can see the waves. Uh, you can probably see the waves going back and forth. Um, so now um, the uh, policy will turn on in a second. Uh, here you go. And now you can see the red cars are somewhat slowing down. And in fact, the flux is not changing much, but um, it's not stopping and it's not accelerating too much. It's been essentially regulated. Um, and so this was the first instantiation of the algorithm on an actual calibrated IMSA model based on real um, field data, uh, which is essentially the next step towards making it work uh, in a real test. Um, so the, the philosophy, and that's what we're going to do in, in Tennessee, which is our main deployment site, uh, it's not California, it's going to do actually in Tennessee, essentially work with traffic which exhibits these types of instabilities uh, that we can measure, um, uh, hopefully uh, use to feed um, control strategies in real time, and then smooth traffic that way. Um, and so the thing is, um, uh, the, uh, the, the, the algorithm essentially use a reward, which is a modified version of the energy consumed with an, a negative sign. Uh, we have to be careful because when you do that, RL is pretty good at finding all kinds of weird solution, including stopping all the cars on the freeway immediately leads to zero energy. So it needs to be a little bit more tweaked, but simple uh, cost functions like this, assuming good models of the vehicle energy consumption actually work quite well. Um, we're also looking at uh, implementing this for San Francisco. Um, so um, uh, the Bay Bridge is one of the, the, the prime targets. Um, and that's another interesting um, um, setting in which we're also interested in using the thing in, in, in a severe like the, the, the bridge. Uh, and so ultimately, we would hope to be able to use also the, that same model to do that. Um, before I move on to so in software and deploying in hardware, so we first started working with Andreas Malikopoulos from University of Delaware to see if we can use his platform to migrate this to um, um, uh, some hardware platform. So on the left is a typical baseline scenario where there's a roundabout, and the algorithm is used to maximize throughput, so flushing the roundabout as fast as possible. So on the left, there's no, no AVs. On the right, the same situation with AVs, and the AVs are essentially the blue vehicles. And if you observe the two movies in comparison, what you will see is that um, the blue uh, cars on the left, uh, on the right, have sequenced themselves in a way that prevents this queuing on the left here, so that the Hummer, which is the last vehicle in that setting, exits the roundabout later than the last vehicle in that setting, which is the cardinal-looking um, you know, vehicle here. So. Uh, here, the, it's not that spectacular, but the point was to show that you can migrate a policy learned in software in uh, hardware, which we have replicated then on other platforms that we deploy in the lab. This was at, at the CPS meeting in uh, Washington uh, right before the pandemics. Um, and that also, um, uh, now if I look at a little bit deeper into what's happening below the hood, um, then uh, I think that um, it, what's interesting is, um, uh, so if you think about the standard loop of uh, reinforcement learning, 
um, essentially you have the agent which provides an action that is running the environment and based on the reward you update your action and the computation of that reward in some ways does um, encompass knowledge of the state so if you remember what i said about the um, about the model free learning earlier um, the approaches that were used in the past uh, prior to Kathy Wu's work not only relied on knowing the state, but in essentially relied on producing an explicit model that had an evolution for the state, so your dynamical system to model a system. What Kathy did is essentially remove that and learn and enable or demonstrate that one can learn from an environment which produces the state, but that you can actually treat like a black box. And so that's, in a sense, the first crime from a puristic uh, traffic flow modeling perspective is that what it's saying is like, as long as you have a very good simulator, regardless of how you built, um, you can learn and control from the output of that simulator without looking in the black box. Now, what Feng Yu Wu, who is a current PhD student in uh, electrical engineering and computer science, is currently working on is, uh, I would say, pursuing an even worse crime, which is forgetting about the state. What if you could actually learn not from the state, but from the rendering of a state? So from a picture of the state. So in the context of traffic, what if you could learn from a picture of traffic? And more specifically, and in the context of Mini City, the city of uh, Andreas Malikopoulos, the idea be being, um, let's forget about the state. Uh, let's just compute um, uh, a, a, a picture or let's render a picture of the state um, from which one can compute the reward without accessing the state and essentially it given that with the pictures is associated a reward so typical pixel learning approach uh, okay so for this you do you do need to have some form of modification of the reward function which i'll just uh, skip for now but what's amazing is that when we did that now what we started doing is not learn from this result of a simulation but essentially from an MP4 movie. Uh, so you generate an MP4 movie um, from your simulators. In that case, it's a simulator we built. And then you use that simulator uh, to feed the algorithm. And we managed to demonstrate already that with the simple cases like the ring and the eight figure, essentially we're almost able to match um, the performance of an algorithm that's actually access to the states of the vehicles uh, by just rendering it. Um, and then you can imagine what you can do with this um, you could try to learn from the whole movie, like I'm doing here. Um, but you could also imagine that in the future, uh, if you had a fully decentralized multi-agent algorithm, you could just learn from the local observations of the vehicle. So in other words, if I'm a vehicle here, um, it's fair to assume that I will know uh, my surroundings. So I'm, I'm traveling somewhere on that map on the left, but I can only see some things within my radius. And if the algorithm has access to all these, so just... Imagine the car senses locally, your local Tesla, you know, it, it senses locally and then it uploads that data. Um, could one run an algorithm from that data? Uh, and if you push this even one step further, um, I mean, this is kind of what you would look from if you were in a car, um, you can actually have um, almost near real time access to all the vehicles around you. The Tesla, I think has six cameras, so it can see in almost every direction. Um, so the notion that that processing could even be done in the vehicle and just uh, be sent um, uh, back to the network for, for learning is also possible. Now, that's not going to happen before 10 years. But the point is that the interesting thing here is that mobile traffic flow control has a model-free path in the future, and that model-free path could even be degraded further into pixels. And so in other words, uh, pixel learning at global scale for mobile traffic control is probably something that will happen in 10 or 15 years. I mean, we're not there yet. Um, and what these algorithms do is demonstrate the feasibility of at least the first steps that leads towards uh, this new paradigm. So, you know, kind of going back to um, the history of how that became famous, you probably all have seen now the um, DeepMind's work on Q learning a few years back, where um, uh, essentially pixel learning enabled um, simple RL algorithms to uh, win at Atari games. So if, like me, you grew up in the late 70s and early 80s, um, this is probably the video games you were playing when, when you were like a six years old kid. Um, and you probably remember that playing Pong is actually not that easy. And that if you played Pong a lot, then after a while you would, you know, 
again, expert knowledge where you would actually dig a hole here. So then the ball would ping pong back and back and back and up. And what's amazing is that with pixel learning, so same idea, um, you can actually uh, teach an algorithm to play pong as good as a human. Um, and it will learn the same tricks as the human. And just like the implementation we have, the point here is that uh, the RL algorithm does not have access to the speed of the ball or the state of the system. It only has access to the score, so the reward, and it has access to the pictures. So it learns directly from the pictures, not from um, a knowledge, an expert knowledge of the state. And ultimately, it manages to build that trench I was just talking about. And so, you know, similar, uh, very um, um, uh, un expected moves um, were generated in AlphaGo, and this is like a very famous time when, um, again, the RL built the world champion. So, I mean, the, the question is, well, will the same one day happen with traffic? In other words, could we use videos of traffic, like the ones I'm showing here, and many more of them to achieve a um, similar level of successes? And this is really a big motivation for what we do here. And so I think the trick here is that, um, I mean, this algorithm for many of them, we, we don't have many proofs of, um, optimality, obviously, or even convergence or stability. Uh, there's, it's a lot of experimental machine learning work in that um, what we're doing here is, is essentially inventing rewards and control structures that essentially enable the RL algorithms to find uh, better solutions. Um, but I, I think that the, what comes out of it is quite spectacular is that uh, we would not really have imagined um, that this type of approaches would uh, match what the human is doing, and in some cases really exceed it. So what we built about three or four years ago now, and that we're still using, and you guys can download from our website, um, is a framework that enables this. Um, so the framework specifically integrates both Sumo and Imson. Uh, so Sumo being the open source version of a you know, micro simulator, and then Imson being a commercial version now owned by Siemens, um, into a framework that uh, runs on AWS that can call state-of-the-art libraries like RLlib and RLLab. Uh, and actually, we're really excited because um, we were the first case study of Imson on the cloud. Like Imson moved uh, its platform to a cloud-compatible architecture about three and a half years ago um, for the two projects I showed before, the Connected Corridors and this project. Obviously, now it, it runs on the cloud, and that's really awesome. Uh, but we were the first one for which that yeah, usage was used. And so obviously, Sumo runs on AWS. That's uh, almost by design. Um, and so you can uh, download this, including Sumo, and that way it's, it's a fully open source and, 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 and open. Um, so where we're going with this is essentially, obviously, there's a long ways to go. I mean, the, I showed some Lego blocks that are simple. Uh, I mean, we're not ready to run Manhattan. We're not ready to run arterials at scale. I mean, obviously, it's pretty, uh, there's still a long way to go. Uh, but what we're excited about is um, we also in the process of putting some standardized tests online. Uh, so for those of you who do robotics, you probably have used Mujoko. I mean, that would be the standard benchmarking example that one uses to try new algorithms. Um, and uh, so you've seen most likely the, 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 these videos that people generate with Mujoko. Um, I think there is a true need for something similar in traffic. Um, and so part of what we're doing is dashboarding uh, some of the uh, work we do so that we provide a unified framework for some, um, I would say, benchmark scenarios that hopefully can be down the road open for the world to compete. Um, that's something we launched in 2018 at Crawl and that we're, we've been working on since. Still not fully operational, but, but, but soon it will be. Um, so that's all supported by essentially this uh, Flow and Sumo um, uh, libraries that I was showing here. Um, that now in the context of what we're doing with the U.S. Department of Energy feed some energy um, databases so that we can establish the leaderboard uh, and the leaderboard will be the basis for this Mujoko um, uh, vision we have uh, in the future. Uh, that's what the dashboard looks like when you um, uh, use it. Uh, the horizontal axis is essentially the time at which algorithms were checked, and then the vertical axis rather scores, uh, so the higher the better score. Um, and then as you run an algorithm, it will generate a lot of different um, things that you can use to benchmark your uh, algorithm, so see how well it does. So in particular, when it gives you the score, it also gives you a bunch of the statistics, as well as the resulting time-space diagrams to tell you how well the smoothing um, of your flow went. 
Um, and so you can look more in detail. So that's still not open. And in a sense, if you're interested, we can check in algorithms for you, but we don't have it in an open framework, mostly because there are some issues with running the evaluation process. Uh, means you have to run a full uh, sumo uh, calibrated model of uh, real freeway, the I-210, and that is expensive. So we can't just have the world use our AWS credits. We do have some issues to figure out um, in order to run this, but that aside, we, we're, we have been able to run a lot of algorithms and we have run many algorithms uh, so far. Um, we also have tutorials that uh, we, we offer once in a while. Um, last one was in Nice, uh, and that's really nice because we have been able to grow our user community. And then finally, um, so wh where's this going? Uh, most of what I've spoken about today is things that were done at Berkeley uh, in partnership with some of the other Circles Consortium uh, universities. But we, we're building a bigger consortium with uh, industry partners, in particular Toyota GM, and hopefully soon another, uh, for now, undisclosed uh, partner that, that is going to be part of our team. Um, and then we have so far worked on one operational uh, location for test in Tennessee, uh, in Nashville. Um, and that's why we have these very strong connections now with the Tennessee Department of Transportation that is providing us the, the site. Um, we have already four or five vehicles across three campuses uh, at Berkeley, our University of Arizona, and Vanderbilt. And essentially, the way we are looking at implementing these first longitudinal controllers is uh, through Coma AI and the Panda um, interface, which enables us to pass Sumo generated controller uh, into Simulink generated code. We test that once in gazebo, maybe we'll do it once in Carla, but for now gazebo, uh, before it actually gets transformed into ROS code um, so that we can then integrate this into the software stack of the vehicle. Um, in the meantime, we've been driving over 10,000 miles of um, uh, a RAV4 that is currently held in Arizona um, that enables us to gather a ton of radar data and, 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 and video data, uh, which will be the primary sensing mechanism for uh, anti-collision uh, for the algorithm we do. And we do have the ability already to drive the car remotely uh, with a little uh, joystick you can see here, um, which is uh, ultimately the way we're going to access uh, the control stack. Uh, that's something we can do with the Toyota RAV4s. Um, and we hope to be able to achieve the same level of uh, interface with our code with uh, GM vehicles, uh, hopefully in the next uh, six to nine months. Uh, finally, uh, and this is maybe the last point I'm going to make. Um, so we plan a major deployment next year, uh, 2022 in Nashville. Uh, so we're doing preliminary tests this year on I-24. And um, so for those of you who are familiar with the NGSM data set, which was one of the high resolution, high value, um, um, you know, in the 2000, in the 2000 years uh, or so, Ish, um, uh, was a very nice way to access high resolution trajectory data at uh, almost uh, 10 hertz frame, which for traffic data at the time was very, very rich. Um, so this, this time we're, we're doing something much bigger. And, and so Dan Work's team at Vanderbilt um, has essentially started implementing a very large scale implementation of, of uh, like the next generation video data for this. So what you see here is a few weeks back, they actually put the first poles on the ground um, to upload some six pack video camera data that goes on top of the poles. It's kind of Herculean work. Okay, here's the first pole. There's going to be another, another few. So this is a multi-million dollar program now that Vanderbilt is running with um, the Tennessee Department of Transportation to instrument the uh, do very high resolution measurements uh, of traffic. So you could view this as the Kind of next generation NGSM data run the first tests. Um, obviously, it's going to take a lot of time to instrument the whole freeway. So, uh, but the, free, the first three poles are operational now, and it's amazing the ability now we have to not only measure traffic but also extract automatically the vehicle class and from that infer the vehicle energy consumption models from autonomy in um, Argonne and plug this into our um, flow framework. Um, so, if you're interested, um, we have everything open source. Uh, we don't have the latest runs that you saw open source. Obviously, there's always a delay be between the time we managed to do it and the manage to post it, but all the classical cases initially presented um, uh, that uh, can serve almost as a tutorial um, can be downloaded from uh, that repo. And then if you're interested in the more general uh, problems we are working on now leveraging that framework, um, we have a four consortium of five universities um, that are um, participating to this work. 
uh, together with the major department of transportation in Tennessee, other um, um, partners of uh, the public sector, and then of course OEMs who are part of it. We're going to continue growing this. We're also going to probably start a, a yearly workshop to uh, gather a broader interest group of um, academics and practitioners interested in mixed autonomy traffic. So understanding how one can start to use even level two of autonomy to um, uh, smooth traffic and beyond. And if you're interested, uh, send us an email and then we'll, we'll, we'll try to um, keep you informed of uh, the events we hold in the not so distant future. And so I think with this, I'm gonna stop. And uh, I don't know if time has been built in for questions, but um, if so, I'm very happy to answer any question you have.